Hey everybody, this is lecture number three. We're going to talk about laboratory professional credentialing and professional organizations. Um, we touched on these topics a little bit in lecture two, but in this lecture we are going to discuss them in more detail. Um, along with this lecture, there are a few articles posted that I want you guys to read, and I hope that between this lecture and those articles, you'll really get a better understanding of all the different lab organizations that are out there, and that you'll get a little bit of clarity on the whole credentialing, certification versus licensure debate um, that still happens today. All right, so let's get into it. So our objectives for this lecture... Um, Number one, define certification, registration, and licensure, and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each. Number two, identify credentialing agencies for laboratory personnel. Number three, compare and contrast different certification levels for laboratory professionals and list the appropriate initials for each. And number four, Distinguish between different professional organizations and describe how they serve laboratory professionals. Okay, so let's just uh, start here by defining some terms. Um, it's important to know the difference between these three terms. They get thrown around a lot. So certification, registration, and licensure. Certification, um, the definition is the action or process of providing someone with an official document attesting to a status or level of achievement. Certification can be provided by a government or a non-government private entity. Now, registration, the definition of registration is the action or process of registering or being registered. This is essentially a list or a register of qualified individuals on an official roster by either a governmental or non-governmental private entity. And licensure. Licensure refers to the granting of licenses for professionals. So in this case, a government agency grants permission to an individual to engage in a given occupation upon finding that the applicant has attained the minimum competencies put forth by the agency. Um, and these definitions are all in your lecture manual, so you can refer to that for those definitions. Now, there is a difference between certification and licensure, um, but people often try to use those terms interchangeably. So certification is less restrictive than licensure, and it does not prevent non-certified personnel from performing the same work as the certified personnel. Licensure, on the other hand, prohibits non-licensed individuals from providing certain services. So the big difference between certification and licensure, um, and why can't we use these terms interchangeably? Well, licensure makes it illegal to engage in work without a license, if a license is required. However, it is not illegal for someone to engage in the work without a certification. Um, a certification basically restricts the right to use a professional title. So licensure essentially makes it unlawful or illegal to do the work if you do not have a license when one is required. In certification, there's not a legality to it. So when we talk about our profession, um, who is licensed? in laboratory sciences. So currently in the US, there are 11 states and Puerto Rico that require um, license. So in our profession, most clinical labs in the hospital do have requirements for certification, but these requirements are on the institutional level. So the hospital is making those requirements of you. However, the few states in the US that do require a license to work as a laboratory professional, um, those are on the state level, and so the government actually mandates that you have a license to do that work. Um, different states that have requirements to um, have a license to do the work, they actually require different things for you to obtain that license. So it's not standard from state to state. Um, and again, the map on this slide shows the blue states are the ones that currently require licensure. Um, and I'm going to note here that while different states do have different requirements for getting that license, most in 
involve obtaining a, certif a certification as part of that process. So most of them will want you to be certified in order to go on and get a license. So who else is licensed? Um, outside of the laboratory profession, there are lots of other occupations that are licensed. We all know about RNs, registered nurses, they have license. Um, other healthcare occupations that require licensures include physicians, um, PAs, which is a physician assistant, a physical therapist, pharmacist, midwives, um, radiology techs, so there's a lot that require license, and that's good. I want these people who are involved in saving my life to be licensed individuals. So there are also licenses, um, licensure is also required for some non-healthcare occupations. And that can include everything from painters and barbers to bartenders, dog catchers, cosmetologists, plumbers, school bus drivers, and the list goes on and on. So if we think about this for a minute, it requires a license to mix drinks and catch dogs, but in many states, it's not required to perform laboratory testing, and that includes moderate and high complexity testing. So let's think about that for a minute. Yeah, that's kind of crazy, huh? So of the 11 states that require license, there are two currently that are at risk of losing their licensure requirements, and that's Tennessee and Montana. So earlier this year, the Tennessee State Legislature introduced a bill, and that bill was essentially it would exempt lab personnel that worked in private labs from license requirements. Um, so again, this, this only applied to private labs. Um, and doesn't include most hospitals, but that's sort of, once you start taking those steps, sometimes they keep going. And in Montana, a bill was introduced this year that would repeal licensing laws for all clinical laboratory science practitioners. So that includes everyone, not just private labs. So just because a state currently has licensure requirements doesn't mean that they will always have those requirements. Um, and this is something that, as laboratory professionals, we need to be aware of, and we need to work to make sure licensure states um, keep their licensure requirements, and we need to think about um, advocating in more states to get licensure in other states. Advantages and disadvantages of licensure. So why do we want licensure anyway? Who cares? Um, there are actually a lot of advantages to licensure, which um, includes more professional recognition. Um, it shows that it can increase patient safety. It improves the quality of laboratory testing. And there's potential for better pay. And we're all for better pay, right? Um, there are some disadvantages to licensure also. Um, so it has the potential to cause unnecessary burdens caused by the process to obtain a license. So lots of paperwork, that kind of stuff, some red tape. Um, and also the license for one state generally will not transfer to another state. So we don't have that reciprocity there that some uh, professions have. And that can make moving between states difficult, especially if the states both require licensure and you've got to get another license. That's just kind of a hassle. So those are some things to keep in mind. All right, let's move on to another issue in the lab sciences field, um, and that is the various professional titles that are used. And I'm certain that most of you have encountered some of this um, craziness. So for the most part, we can categorize lab professionals, kind of the, the general um, lab professionals working in the lab on the bench. We can uh, categorize those in sort of two different categories. Um, so we've got the bachelor's level degree, and that generally includes titles like MT, MLS, and CLS. And the other category is the associate's degree level, which includes the MLT and CLT titles. Um, so what, what does all this mean? So let's go through these letters here. So MT is medical technologist. 
MLS is Medical Laboratory Scientist, CLS is Clinical Laboratory Scientist, and on the Associate's degree level, um, we've got MLT, which is Medical Laboratory Technician, and CLT, which is Clinical Laboratory Technician. These titles get thrown around a lot. These letters are all over the place and they often get used interchangeably. Um, and sometimes that's okay. CLT and MLT is the same thing. They're both associate level um, technologists working in the lab. So where did all these titles come from? Why all the letters? So it goes back to certifying exams and license requirements. So remember in a previous lecture, we talked about the AMT certification exam. Um, this exam still exists and the credentials that are associated with that exam are medical technologists. So if you certified through the AMT, your credentials are medical technologist or MT. Now, that used to be true of the ASCP certification exam, but that has actually changed. So the ASCP Board of Certification, um, their credentials are now MLS, which is Medical Laboratory Scientist. The Clinical Laboratory Scientist title is mostly associated with um, licensure states. So it's very common in California. You'll see them use that title um, a lot more, but those laboratory scientists, if they are certified through ASCP, their, their credentials are actually MLS, but they might fill a role that was advertised as CLS. Are we all confused yet? Okay. Um, so there are also lots of other types of laboratory professionals. Um, some of you may know there are histotechnologists, cytotechnologists, phlebotomists, pathologist assistant, um, and a lot of them also have letters. So sometimes you'll see those um, thrown around as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these um, credentialing agencies for laboratory personnel. Um, there are three major agencies that offer certification exams, and that is the ASCP Board of Certification, the AMT, which we've um, already mentioned, those two, and then the last one is the AAB Board of Registry, which is the American Association of Bioanalysts Board of Registry. So the ASCP um, Board of Certification is the most common that you'll see. And the credentials for that exam, depending on which exam you're taking, um, will be MLS, MLT, or you can get a specialist or a categorical um, letter behind your name. So if you were to take the special exam, specialist exam in blood bank, then you get a little SBB behind your name. And there's also situations where you might take a categorical test through ASCP, meaning you're just taking one part of the exam. So maybe you work in chemistry and you only want to get the chemistry certification, you can do that. It's not recommended and there's usually kind of special circumstances surrounding that, but it, it is possible. And then um, that would give you another letter behind your name, like a different letter. So you can see there um, the MLS and the MLT, and that's how your credentials should look if you are certified through the Board of Certification. And that little CM at the end is um, credentials maintained or certification maintained. Um, and that came about when they started requiring the um, continuing education to keep your certification where you recertify every three years. And once you start recertifying, you put that little CM up there to um, show everybody that you maintain your certification, in case y'all were wondering. Um, so the AMT, this is probably the second most common, credential agent, common credentialing agency. Um, and their certifications uh, it include medical technology, medical laboratory technician, um, and also RPT, which is Registered Phlebotomy Tech, CMLA, which is Certified Medical Laboratory Assistant, and then MDT, which is Molecular Diagnostics Te Technologist. So many letters, guys. Um, and so if you take and pass one of the AMT exams, that would be the credentials behind your name. So you would be MT or MLT and so on. 
And then probably the least common credentialing agency in the U.S. is the American Association of Bioanalysts, and they offer the Board of Registry. Um, so their certifications are very similar to AMT. So they have an exam for MT, MLT, and then they also have this um, MDXT, which is a molecular diagnostics technologist also. So the AAB also has another um, examination sort of board for, um, I believe it's for management level. Um, and so you can test for different management levels there and add even more letters to your name. So it's important to define the scope of practice for laboratory scientists all, uh, also. And the scope of practice just outlines the procedures, actions, processes that a licensed or certified individual is permitted to perform. So states with licensure requirements um, will define the scope of practice for their licensed individuals and failure to comply with those um, can, can result in legal ramifications. So it's always important to know if you're questioning, if you're allowed to do something, you're, it's good to know if that's in your scope of practice. So is there a difference in scope of practice for MLS and MLT? Um, so the answer to that really varies depending on the facility and the state that you are working in. Some employers do not differentiate between MLS and MLT for bench level positions, um, except for maybe in pay. Several agencies routinely differentiate between MLT and MLS. Um, this includes certification agencies, also educational accreditation agencies like NACLs. CLIA differentiates and state licensing boards will also differentiate. Okay, switching gears a little bit, we are going to turn our focus now to professional organizations. Um, there are two general types of professional organizations related to lab sciences. We've got these kind of general umbrella organizations, and then we have organizations that are more discipline specific. So both types have advantages, um, such as they will advocate for the profession, um, offering continuing education, producing lab related publications, um, promoting our professional identity, and so on. So let's get into this. Um, some of the larger, more well-known professional organizations are the ASCLS, ASCP, CLMA, and CLSI. Um, yay, more letters. I know y'all are excited. So the ASCLS, which is the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science. This organization is run by laboratory professionals. Um, it offers their members continuing education opportunities, sponsors national and state meetings um, and different conferences. They publish the Clinical Laboratory Science Journal um, and they also employ a lobbyist which represents uh, laboratory interests in Washington, D.C. So this organization, a lot of laboratory scientists really like this organization and support this organization. They do a lot of really good stuff. The CLMA, this is the Clinical Laboratory Management Association. And even though it has the word management in the title, it's really for laboratorians in any stage of their career. Um, they also hold national and state meetings, and they contribute to the body of knowledge for medical laboratory management document. So the body of knowledge is a document that the ASCLS um, produces, and it sort of just outlines what they think that laboratory scientists should know and be competent in within five years of um, their career starting. So the ASCP, we've mentioned this one several times already and you'll continue to hear about it. Um, this is the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Um, it's one of the largest organizations, and remember it was originally founded by pathologists, but now it represents non-physician laboratorians also. Um, they produce several different publications, and they also hold a national meeting, and probably one of the bigger meetings, I would say. 
So lastly over here, we've got the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. We have mentioned this one briefly before. Um, they provide standards and guidelines um, for different topics, different uh, departments in the lab. So for example, they might um, provide guidelines to help standardize testing for antibiotic susceptibilities in micro. That's what I have used the CLSI guidelines for before in the past. Very helpful. So this um, organization does hold quarterly meetings, but those are for their committees that um, meet and write these standards. I'm not entirely sure how you become um, a member of one of these committees, but I am certain that it requires a lot of um, experience in your field. So some discipline specific professional organizations. Um, the American Association of Blood Banks, the AABB, um, this one provides patient blood management resources um, and they develop standards for transfusion medicine. They also offer accreditation to blood banks. So that's another way that blood banks can get accreditation and, you know, sort of prove to the public that they um, are up to certain standards. The ASM, which is the American Society for Microbiology, um, promotes microbial sciences. So this society is for all micro, not just clinical micro. So they've got environmental, they've got um, cave micro, stream micro, water micro, ocean micro, just all kinds of uh, micro, just anything you can think of. Um, they have actually recently increased their efforts to include clinical microbiology. So in the past, it's played a very small role and they're actually trying to really um, increase the role of, of clinical micro at the meeting. So they do have a lot of uh, sessions on clinical micro now at the meetings. The American Association of Clinical Chemistry or AACC, this is a pretty big organization also. Um, they obviously support clinical chemistry, but they have a lot of resources for other lab science departments also. Um, this organization supports the lab tests online website. If you guys haven't checked that out, go to it. It's actually run and um, supported by laboratory scientists. And I've actually seen opportunities to volunteer to help with this website, answer questions from people. So there are actually laboratory scientists out there that are answering the questions and actively involved in this website. Um, it's really neat. You guys should check it out if you haven't and the AMP, AMP, the Association for Molecular Pathology. This is a pretty new organization. It was founded in 1995. And remember, that was the year that the National Labor Relations Board finally uh, recognized us as professionals. So it's not that long ago. Um, but that same year, uh, the AMP was founded. And this organization provides resources for molecular diagnostics. They, provo uh, sorry, they promote development of new molecular testing, um, both clinical and research. So just a quick note here about other organizations. Um, we talked about organizations for blood bank, chemistry, micro, molecular. So what about hematology and immunology? Well, there are professional organizations for those disciplines. Um, but unfortunately, the membership has been limited for uh, limited to the MD, PhD, doctorate level only. Um, so those organizations tend to focus their resources more on that level, but they do have some resources that are good for us as laboratory scientists. And um, sometimes they will have educational information for patients, and that's also stuff that we can use to kind of learn and see what they're telling patients and um, that kind of stuff. So they do have resources that are, you know, useful to us. We just cannot be members of those societies unless we go on to the, the doctorate level. And then there are also organizations that are just organizations that are not um, clinical laboratory science focused. So my example that I have here is the American Society of Parasitologists. Um, 
This website likely has some really good resources and images, but it's not limited to clinical. So what you'll see is parasites of all kinds, not just the ones that um, are infecting humans. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Um, I cut it a little bit short since I'm having you guys do some readings to go along with this. And I really hope this information helps clarify some of the really confusing aspects of certification and licensure. Um, this debate goes on. If you guys are on that big MLS Facebook group, you see this all the time. Um, so this was just a short introduction and a short introduction especially to the professional organizations. So I encourage all of you to go explore those more, look at their websites, see what resources they have. Occasionally you'll run across some free continuing education, which is, we all love that, right? Um, and check out what kind of advocacy issues they're supporting. So if you find one or two that align with you know, what you are want to be involved in, I encourage you to become members of those groups and really get involved. And with the readings, I encourage you guys um, to start a discussion amongst yourself on your Facebook group or whatever group you've got going um, and discuss these articles. So what do you guys think about this licensure issue? Should all states require licensure? And what about those of you that are already working in states that require licensure? Have you guys seen any benefits? Um, did you encounter any of the red tape there um, trying to get your license? So what do you guys think? I'd love to know your opinion on this. And that is it for lecture three.